The Kathet Regional District, covering the territory of the Klamath Nation and the city of Powell River, as well as adjacent areas, is home to healthy populations of numerous species of large land mammals, including grizzly bears, black bears, bobcats, cougars, wolves, elk, mountain goats, raccoons, deer, beavers, and river otters. The Ministry of Forests, Lands, and Natural Resource Operations considers bears, cougars, wolves, and coyotes, who also occasionally appear in the area, to be dangerous species and this video will discuss the recent history of human interactions with these species in this territory. In 1905, the provincial government created the position of Deputy Game and Forest Wardens, who were entrusted to enforce laws related to game, forestry and fish in the province. In time, professional game wardens were hired to enforce the Game Protection Act of 1914 that essentially regulated hunting practices one of the major infractions in this period was pit lamping, or shining a light in the eyes of animals, usually deer, to make them freeze and make it easier to shoot them. In 1918, the BC Provincial Police Force took over the role of game enforcement. By 1920, there were 24 special police constables in all of British Columbia who worked specifically on game protection work and they had their own department set up for game law enforcement later in the decade. As the words game protection and game warden suggest, the priority at this time was to protect and encourage the propagation of game species, especially deer, mountain goats, and elk, from abuses by hunters and through predator control. Predators, like cougars, were considered varmint and a bounty of $40 was placed on cougars in the 1920s. Rex Paget explained how the ba bounty worked in Powell River. All you did was take a skin to the postmaster and he punched a hole in the ear. It was actually a lot of money, $40. A pair of cock shoes was $5. So actually the cougar hunting was almost a source of income to a great extent and held a lot of fun because you had a 10 mile jaunt through the snow and the thrill of it and also the idea that we were the damn good guys. Rex added that everyone was under the impression that if we killed cougars there would be lots of deer for us to eat. But looking back the deer did not increase when the cougars decreased. Another pressing worry for people in these times was the protection of livestock and pets from attacks by predators. Rex Paget explained what life was like when his family arrived at their homestead in Powell River in 1919. That I can remember quite vividly. We had some goats, 200 chickens, and about 10 geese. You lived practically in those days. You shot your meat, and sometimes meat was scarce. There were numerous reports from the period of families losing dogs, cats, goats, sheep, and chickens to cougars and bobcats. Probably the most chilling encounter was recorded in 1928 when Martin Alsgaard from Cranberry drove into a cougar with his boat as they were both heading in the same direction towards Goat Island on Powell Lake. The injured cougar attempted to climb up onto his boat while well, those on board fought it off with a large wrench and a boat hook. They eventually killed the injured cougar once the animal swam ashore. Another hair-raising encounter with a cougar took place in Cranberry on a foggy October morning in 1939. Mrs. Turnbull was walking along Cranberry Street to town site when she noticed what she thought was a large dog walking the same direction about 60 feet in front of her. She didn't think much of it until she saw the animal turn around. She realized that it was a cougar and it started running towards her. She quickly turned and ran towards the nearest house as fast as she could. Luckily for her, at that moment, a car came up from town site and happened to drive past them on the road. This frightened the cougar and it ran into the bushes. The driver then 
seeing Mrs. Turnbull so scared, offered to give her a lift the rest of the way. Conser Conservation Officer Jerry Lister notes that cougars are curious animals and they have a chase instinct. They're 100% predators and only eat fresh meat, unlike bears, who are not so particular. So never run away from a cougar and in order to be safe, show the cougar that you're not prey, make noise, carry a walking stick and make yourself appear large. After a brief suspension, a $10 bounty per animal was restored on cougars in 1932. Attorney General Robert Pooley explained that the action was taken because of pleading that havoc was being wrought by the cat-like marauders on sheep and other flocks. The bounty did lead to awkward mix-ups. For instance, in 1933, a large yellow dog owned by Rod LeMay of Wildwood was falsely identified as a cougar. Luckily the dog was not shot by mistake. The annual culls were published by the Game Commission and in 1935 there were 430 cougars shot in the province. In 1936 in the Powell River District the lo local game warden shot 26 cougars and 92 wolves. The bounty system was finally suspended in 1947 and the Predator Control Branch took over the role of culling predators. This role today is entrusted to conservation officers who euthanize cougars who pose a threat to public safety, as there are no relocation programs for cougars. In the 1950s, there was a significant shift in public attitudes towards wildlife, and predators like cougars became listed as protected big game animal species. The name for game wardens was also changed to conservation officers in BC in 1961. This was a recognition that they were working, in addition to working with game species, they were also protecting animal habitat, such as streams and lakes, and enforcing rules against dumping garbage in the forests. In 1966, the Game Act was replaced with the Wildlife Act, and it sought to ensure broader environmental protection for more animal species instead of just simply propagating game species. In 1980, conservation officers were placed under the Ministry of the Environment, and they've since been tasked with dealing with a broad range of issues relating to fish, wildlife, and environmental protection. An excellent example of the conservation approach uh, to restore and preserve the natural biodiversity of the coastal forest is the reintroduction of elk along the south coast, which was the historical range for the species. The program has brought back Roosevelt elk from Vancouver Island to the south coast, where the habitat is suitable for elk, but the elk populations disappeared long ago. One herd, however, of Roosevelt elk had survived at Phillips River, which is about 80 kilometers up the coast from Lund. Successful reintroductions of elk took place in the Sunshine Coast um, between 1987 and 1993, and then in Powell River from 2001 to 2006, and finally in some more remote areas around Toba Inlet from 2007 to 2012. This has been a very successful program, and the elk populations around Haslam Lake are now considered to be fully recovered. At the same time, there have been a couple of noteworthy attacks on human beings by large mammals in the area. In 2015, there was a defensive attack near the town center mall in Powell River when a man who had been walking his dog was knocked to the ground by a mother black bear. The man and his dog had inadvertently come between the mother and her two cubs. These bears were all put down soon afterwards by conservation officers. The reason was they had become human habituated and they displayed dangerous behavior. In addition to knocking the man down, they had entered properties and had shown aggression to other people. Every year, b uh, black bears who demonstrate such human habituation are destroyed by conservation officers. The worst recent wildlife attack occurred in 2019 near Ramsey Arm, which is about 60 kilometers up the coast from Lund. 
In mid-August of that year, a cyclist from Campbell River came across a large grizzly bear in a very remote area. The bear ignored the man's attempts to scare him off, then knocked him onto the ground and dragged him about 50 feet into a ditch, where he began chewing on his legs. The man, who was screaming in agony, saved his own life by stabbing the bear in the neck with a pocket knife. He then managed to bandage up his own wounds and rode his bike seven kilometers to a camp where he found help and was then air ambulance to Vancouver. Conservation officers returned the following day to the site of the attack and found the grizzly bear who began to stalk them. They then shot and identified the bear. Thankfully though, this sort of horrifying encounter is very rare. There are also many success stories where bears are persuaded to return to the woods from town without any conflict. On one occasion, conservation officer Jerry Lister was called to a property whose owner said that there was a bear living under the house. Jerry figured that the bear might be trying to den in the crawl space under the house. So, with a flashlight, he went on his hands and knees into the crawl space, and sure enough, there was a bear sitting there still awake, looking at him. Jerry slowly crawled back without incident. In order to convince the bear to leave, they filled the crawl space with two cans of pepper spray, and after about five minutes, the bear came out and realized the air was much fresher outside and then ran off. They didn't have any more trouble with that bear. Of all wild animals in the Cathet Regional District, deer, in many ways, are more difficult to deal with than most other species, even those who are considered to be dangerous species. Deer are apt to roam freely in town, a common frustration for gardeners. It is also not uncommon to come across a deer who is injured, perhaps having disease, a hurt leg, being caught in garden netting, or on more than one occasion having an arrow stuck in it. For conservation officers, assisting injured deer is very complicated because they have a very low tolerance for immo immobilization drugs. In fact, the immobilization drugs available to officers are intended for use on large predators and not deer. If conservation officers do have to immobilize deer, they have to be careful and they will monitor the animal to make sure that it recovers and they also have to mark the animal to ensure that hunters do not harvest it and ingest the residue of the drugs. Jerry Lister said that as a rule of thumb, most wild animals adapt well to injuries, such as foot injuries, and conservation officers try to avoid injecting them with drugs if at all possible. To stay safe in the woods, conservation officer Jerry Lister offers the following advice. Make noise. Noise warns animals that you are there and keeps them away. Keep your dog on a leash and carry a walking stick. Bear spray in a holster or a good fixed blade knife as a defensive weapon just in case. For more information about wildlife safety, you can contact the local office of WildSafe BC and to report incidents with wildlife, contact the conservation officer.